Well, I think the word hacker has a number of connotations. I am a hacker, but uh, you know, I've managed to stay out of jail um, and uh, and even get paid for it. My name is Katie Masaurus. I'm the founder and CEO of Luta Security, a company that helps governments and large organizations deal with security holes. I am a retired professional hacker. I should not be able to hack anything today. I've been retired from professional hacking since 2007. Why should a hacker that retired that long ago still be able to hack things? The shortcomings for the security industry are really that we see the same cyclical bugs coming in over and over again. And organizations, you know, write new code every day, and we're never going to get ahead of it. So last year, I hacked Clubhouse. I didn't mean to. It was a accident. Totally. Accidents happen. And what happened was I tried to report a vulnerability. It took me a couple of weeks even to find the right point of contact. And they weren't responding to me even when I did until I had to send them a video of myself presenting the five stages of vulnerability response grief um, so that they could kind of get over the denial, the anger, you know, the bargaining, et cetera, and get to acceptance so that we could work together. My mom was a scientist. She was a biochemist. So that's where sort of I get my technical knack and my technical bent. She had to remove all the screwdrivers from the house because I was taking everything apart and I would try to put them back together. And sometimes I wasn't, wasn't as good at building as I was at breaking. When I was about eight years old, she bought me my first computer. It was a Commodore 64. It came with a, a cartridge to play Pac-Man. And so when I asked her for more games, she said, you know, that was all the cash I had. She was a single mom. And um, she handed me the basic programming manual that came with the, the computer. We have a saying, you know, RTFM, read the fucking manual. My mom RTFM me and hand, handed me the manuals. Well, I started working at Microsoft because I was recruited there. Immediately, I saw a need to create a vulnerability research program inside of Microsoft. So kind of like Google Project Zero, I started Microsoft Vulnerability Research back in 2008, progressed to end up creating their bug bounty programs. And my career just was kind of stalling out there. I saw male colleagues getting promoted for things that were way less significant than what I had contributed to the company and to the industry. And what was ironic was my bosses were putting me up for promotion. And it was getting shot down for various reasons. When I get feedback, it was super gendered feedback. It was like, you're too pushy. And then I, the next year, uh, you know, I had worked on that. And uh, the answer was, you're not pushy enough. So it was kind of like, they were never going to give it to me. They were never going to reward me properly. Plus they under leveled me in the first place, which you can't know going in. So what led to my lawsuit was effectively that I was there for seven years. And I was underpaid, underpromoted, getting you know lower bonuses than I should have. I could have very easily negotiated an individual settlement for myself. So I knew if I wanted money, I could get it. What I wanted was change, and that's why I sued Microsoft. That's also why I ended up starting the Pay Equity Now Foundation when the class action lawsuit failed. Right now, if you look at the data, we're not set to even see white women achieving pay equity with white men for another 50 years. The pandemic has set that clock way back. It has set back you know, women in careers across all fields by at least a decade. And you see the biggest pay dis disparity, biggest pay gap between professional black women and the rest of the world, right? So the very first donation coming out of my foundation was to establish a law clinic at Penn State Law, and it's named after my late mother. And uh, law clinics work on active cases, and they also are gonna be looking at state-by-state um, -state variances in the laws. My name is Steve Wiley. I'm the general manager of Black Hat. And we are here in Las Vegas this week. It is our 25th anniversary of the Black Hat Conference. Katie is a, a prominent figure in the cybersecurity community. Um, she's been around Black Hat for years. She's spoken at Black Hat for years, and, and she's um, she's just one of the pioneers out there. When you see someone like Katie, you know, a strong woman in the community who's presenting at, at Black Hat, you know, what is that doing for that next generation of up and coming women and, and wanting to submit their own research and have the confidence to submit the research? By the time I decided to start Luta Security, I had had a very long career and I'd had a ton of experiences. And it wasn't 
that I felt like suddenly now I'm ready to start a company. I certainly didn't feel ready, but I felt like it was my only choice. It was my only choice to be paid what I was worth. It was my only choice to set my own rules. So around 2018, um, I decided to start trying to raise venture capital. So I had with me, uh, you know, a COO who was, um, he was a white male, but he was non-technical. His role was in growing startups. And I brought him with me on a lot of these, uh, a lot of these VC meetings. One, you know, the venture capital folks kept looking at him and asking him questions as if he were the founder and CEO. He would keep deferring to me because it was completely my company owned by me, no co-founders, no investors. I think the worst one was a guy who listened to our pitch and then just looked at the COO and said, I just have one question. Why aren't you the CEO and she the CTO? And when my COO answered again that this is all Katie's intellectual property and I am not technical, the guy said, doesn't matter. So no, we never got a single check from a single venture capital uh, investor. It's better that none of those VCs invested because then I'd be stuck on their hamster wheel and their schedule and their incentives, their goals. And instead I had to forge my own way and it's made all the difference. My advice for other female founders would be to try and build as much without outside investors as possible. Women entrepreneurs, if you can do it bootstrapped, stay bootstrapped. Let those VC hounds starve on the, you know, the bones of the patriarchy.